This week's episode is sponsored by Ryan at Change. If you are looking to get involved in e-commerce and build a successful online business, then check out my good friend Ryan, who I have been working with the last few years and attended many events and retreats all around the world, spending time with members who are making some serious money. I have been promoting Ryan for a while now because I believe in what he does and not only has he helped and supported me build my own businesses, but I have seen firsthand how he helps and supports his members take their businesses to new levels and give them financial freedom. So if you are interested in getting into e-commerce and building successful online stores, then message Ryan on his Instagram at RyanJB to join his winning team. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Taylor Cavanagh. Taylor, how are we, brother? Dude, I'm doing well, bro. You're looking well. Thank you. Marine, um, Navy SEAL. Yep. Navy SEAL. Got kicked out, fighting. Yep. Trouble. Potential prison. Bit of pain in the ass. Yep. And then joined the Foreign Legion. That's what's up. Yeah. That's exactly what's up. How's life, brother? It's good, man. It's good. I'm just glad to be coming out the other side. That's, that's the honest truth is I was, and I think you can identify with this, at some point, we just have to make a decision to be better. Like that was, that was at some point I just had to sit down and get honest and go, man, I have to unlearn some shit. <laughs> what I'm doing's not working. It keeps repeating itself. And so that's kind of where I, where I got in the foreign legion provided me the time and the space and the quiet shut the fuck up in a dungeon for a while to think. And then I could start to build a plan. Yeah. Before we get into everything, though, I always like to go back to the start with my guest, get a bit of understanding about you, brother, where you grew up and how it all began. Mm -hmm. Dude, I grew up in San Diego, California. My dad was in the Marines, so I grew up on a Marine base for a little bit. And then we just stayed in California. So I, I had that SoCal bro lifestyle growing up, which was I was grateful for. My family had, had their troubles, you know, out drugs and alcohol and things like that. My mom's a rock, though. But um, so there was a, some explosiveness, you know, grew up with a little little tension. But overall, I think I had a great childhood, man. You know, and uh, I have a little sister and we spent a lot of time outdoors. This wasn't this wasn't the iPad generation, man. This was bikes and jumping, you know, making jumps outside. That's how, that's how I grew up. And it was and it was sports were not pushed. They were just assumed. And I loved it. So we spent a lot of our time and. Both of my parents are very physical. My dad bodybuild, you know, played football. My mom was into aerobics and all that stuff. So I grew up with a pretty solid foundational base for fitness also. How was your dad strict? No. No, my dad wasn't strict. Hard. I mean, he could lay, he'll lay the hat if you got out of line. But he was kind of dealing with his own shit a little bit, you know, and uh, kind of in and out, you know, not some problems with some jobs and then in financial, financial troubles. So he wasn't, he wasn't the strict one. He's pretty chill for mm -hmm. the most part. What were you like at school? I was good. At, I was good with school, man. Growing up, I was, I would do my homework. You know, I played, my thing was played sports, did my homework. And then that kind of started falling off the back of the truck. When you start drinking and partying and the girls and, the, and then we got into high school, those good disciplines <laughs> right out the window man i know that feeling bro <laughs> i fucking know that feeling so so you were you were navy seal or marine navy seal navy seal your dad was a marine yeah so did you want to follow in your dad's footsteps was there peer pressure to go down that same route as your dad no absolutely zero peer pressure for the military from my dad because he was in six and out he wasn't you know big 
military guy as far as like, this is how it's going to be. My mom comes from a more military heritage in uh, my grandfather was a captain in the Marine Corps. I mean, uh, in the Navy and Naval Academy and all this. So I was actually kind of looking maybe at that route for a while. But when I went to college and I, I went to college, I did that whole thing and made a train wreck of it, got arrested so many times I can't even count. And I had to go to jail after college to even try to be able to get in the military. And so I was tried to go in the Marine Corps. They said, no, I had too many tattoos. And then I tried to go in the army and they said, no, I had been arrested too many times. So my dream of, was really the only option. I was scared to try for Navy SEAL because I didn't want to fail and then end up chipping barnacles on a boat. You know, that's what happens. If you fail SEAL training, you're in the fucking Navy, you know? What sort of trouble then were you getting into before joining the military? Being a f fucking knucklehead, just not, not stealing and doing that type of stuff. Drinking, drinking too much, getting arrested for being drunk in public, fighting, a DUI. It was shit like that. It was just being a, a knucklehead. Mm -hmm. What's your dad saying to that? Did he see you slipping? Man, he was kind of out of the picture at this time. You know, he was, there wasn't really in the picture like that. You know, my, my mom, people would be pissed, but a lot of it was just on my own. I wasn't telling everybody anything mm -hmm. anyway, because I was away. So you couldn't get in with tattoos? No, I was too much a percentage of my body was tattooed for the Marine Corps at the time. And it's still like that. They got pretty strict. What is the percentage? Man, I don't know. They sent, they took a picture of my whole body and they sent it up and I, I couldn't even enlist anywhere. They put out like a, like, I don't know what it, how much of a percentage, but I had some of my arms, my back was completely done. Some of my legs, nothing even down here too much and no neck. So I don't know. They were just strict, man. What was the decision to then go though? Were you just feeling like a lost soul at that point, drinking, fighting, getting into trouble? Um, I just, I, since I was seven years old, I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. I remember the moment it happened, I was standing on a hill. It was 1992 and I saw glow lights floating in the bay. And I asked my dad what it was. And he said, there were Navy SEALs training in the bay. From that moment on, I just started researching Vietnam SEALs, Green Berets, that whole commando world really was, spoke to me. So I went down that path. I knew I wanted to be a Navy SEAL, but you know, it got shelved like we talked about, got shelved, got shelved. Then college ended and what do you do? I knew I was going in the military, so that was, that was what I was gonna do. I wasn't even thinking about getting a regular job. What was it, this, what was the, what, how, what goes in place then to then pass the tests and become a Navy SEAL? Yeah, so it was hard for me because they said, okay, you can get in, but you have such a checkered background and tattoos and things that you need all these waivers to actually even try. So I was packing boxes in a warehouse at night, you know, got to live and training in the day with uh, active duty SEALs. They had like a program, Naval Special Warfare program where you could be a civilian and train with these guys. So I got with them as fast as I could because I fucking hate running man that shit's for the enemy <laughs> so and i just so and i never trained with it growing up so i needed to practice man i could barely run a kilometer dead serious i was pu i was had to puke in every day i lost about 25 kilos in in about two months 25 kilos just just i needed it i was like that that rugby big you know like that mm -hmm. kind of and so i needed to trim down and i did and it took me about nine months and you take these seal screening tests formal that the Navy puts out to get your, your name roster racked up at the top. And then one day they offer you a contract for it. What's the contract? It's called the seal challenge contract. And it's you are a civilian now, but you're going in the military on this specific seal trying to be a seal. That's what it is. What's the training like? Is it basic training at the start? It's exactly. So you go through regular basic Navy training for eight weeks with a little bit, had a little bit of special warfare flair. We, we worked out harder. And then you go, if you finish that, then you go into a basic underwater demolition preparatory school, which is like all physical training. That's all SEAL candidates. Mm -hmm. And this is early, early on, right? And then you, they take the top 75% from there and then they take, fly you out to San Diego for the real deal. Real deal, Holyfield uh, seal seal selection. What's that like? A kick in the fucking nuts. It was harder than I thought it was going to be. Way harder. It was carnage. It's the only way I can describe it. It was fucking carnage. How many people? 
We started with 285. We flew out with 400. Then we classed up with 285. Three weeks later, we had 185. Then through three weeks after that, we had 50. That was through Hell Week. And then from that, a lot of guys get fail stuff or whatever, and other guys roll into classes who had been hurt. So we actually finished from that original 285, we finished about 15 guys who actually were originals. But we graduated with 50 guys. So about 50 of that class would graduate. Because you hear Goggins talk about Hell Week. How tough is it? How tough is it to be a Navy SEAL? The Hell Week, the surprising part is people talk about Hell Week, but Hell Week's like shitty, but it's like a fraction of what's actually hard, you know, because Buds is six months long, you know, just that selection is six months and it's that like that every day. You don't, you get weekends off sometimes, but it's carnage all day long, hypothermia all day long, no sleeping. Hell week was tough because obviously you're not sleeping. You start hallucinating in about three, four days. Everybody starts seeing chain link fences in the ocean. Very weird. Must be patterns or something, but you're dick and balls are chafed absolutely raw <laughs> that people don't think about the small thing you get in the ocean and it's brutally chafed raw guys are so chafed in between their legs they have to go to the hospital get skin grafts after like not like some guys like 25 percent of the guys like a lot are so chafed on their right here and on in between their legs from the sand and the salt you have to go to the hospital and get skin grafts what's the benefits for that torture to them pass it's just they want to see who's 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 there to fucking there who's know? there to die who's there to die yeah well, who's who's just committed 100 percent. generally they say by tuesday or wednesday the guys th who are there will just will stay there until they die so they know there's really no point in extending it for much longer than friday what's the main ingredient what did you see with people because you, everybody's a good judge of character to a certain degree, but sometimes people surprise you and you think, fuck me, he done it. But was there a certain ingredient you've seen with someone? Because the biggest, you know yourself, it doesn't necessarily mean you're mm -hmm. the strongest here. It's oh, a yeah. mental thing. But what did you think was the one thing that made people pass? <sighs> not having a plan B. Not having a fucking plan B. When you, if you, that, and you hit the nail on the head there, James. Really, you, you have an idea with some guys. Like that dude's a pipe hitter and he crushes it, right? A lot of my friends, we linked up, we all passed, you know? But then there's, you got those, some kid from the middle of the farm somewhere who never did anything physical will pass. And like you said, like the stud quits. Why is that? And the fucking military has been trying to figure out that psychological profile for years to be able to predict it, but you can't. I would say it's 100% you've, you've mentally painted yourself into a corner. You don't have a plan B. You're, you're there to finish it or you don't have another option. I know that's how it was for me. I, I saw there was no other option for me after. What was the feeling when you passed? Man, it was great. Passing buds was good, but then you gotta remember you have an additional seven months SEAL qualification, SQT, which people don't really think about, which is more technical. Mountain warfare, skydiving, land warfare diving combat diving is like you have all these month cells of stuff that you could fail and get kicked out or fail something physical why is that so much it's 18 months long because man it's fucking, they got to fit it all in man it's actually a lot of stuff you got to learn especially sqt you got to learn how to really you get they got to teach guys sh shooting demolition how to maneuver tactically how to do all these different things not to mention skydiving military free fall halo qualified you know it's uh and combat diving it's a lot of stuff have you got to finish 18 months before you go to any war zones yeah oh yeah so so that 18 months is training is training it's every single seal has to do it and then you go to your seal team you're selected to which seal team you go to and then you're going to have another 18 month cycle so really what's what's unique about the seal teams not unique but special real high level special operations groups are by the time you go on your first deployment, you've been training for like three years, sometimes a little more. So solid too. Did you find out more about yourself then? Because obviously does that training calm you down? Because you seem to have got fucking worse. Man, I was locked on during that time because I was so focused. And the, what the problem was, was when I got there, 
I had fucking arrived, <laughs> right? So that's what, what that was the issue. I had fucking arrived, and so it was a celebratory mood. That's that was. I'm not like the depressed guy that like goes in part. I want to isolate and be alone. But when I'm in a good mood, man, let's turn it up. And so that's where I was at, and it <laughs> that that momentum just pe picked up, mm -hmm. you know. And it was I was locked on at first, and then slowly I got a little more ahead of my skis, a little more ahead, a little more ahead. Yeah, do you think you were caged up for the eighteen months to then? prove to someone Man. maybe yourself your dad but then the ch shackles come off you've done it now what do you always need something in place to work towards <sighs> absolutely i think i have to i have to be purpose driven or if i don't fill it with something positive i'm gonna fill it with something negative i'm filling it with something <laughs> something's going yeah. in there and i was i had lost kind of that purpose i had the purpose i still wanted to be there and i worked my ass off i loved being at work as a seal but it was like when the time off was time off i was i was in such a fucking good mood man it was let's bring it yeah yeah and you with your boys it's kind of the culture it was kind of the culture you go out and party you know and i think like even here in your sas and your sbs those guys get after it and it's just kind of a special it's kind of that culture mm -hmm. and just for me i would take it to that next level sometimes what do you think that is with, with you Ah, oh, man, I just think, I don't know what it is. I mean, who knows what it is? Like, why, why do some guys just kind of maybe metabolizing alcohol poorly or just lack of maturity? I think that that's part of it. I had, some people are old souls. I would say I'm kind of a young soul. I had a lot of learning to do during this lifetime and a lot, a lot of hard lessons. And I think I just... I started to realize how dangerous it can be and how fast things can go wrong. And as it, as it did mm -hmm. later down the road. When did it start slipping? So you've achieved a goal. You've done amazing to be a Navy SEAL. How fast was it before? It was, well, it was pretty much, I had been arrested every year since, since I can remember, since I was 16 years old, arrested every year, all, even in the SEAL teams, I would get arrested for some drunk, like some drunk night, but then it would get kind of swept under the rug. And then it, it was, then the la then a big thing happened. I hit a guy in a bar, and then it was like, no hiding it. You know, I got a felony aggravated assault charge. Was fighting for six years in prison, and the guy, you know, he was hurt, and it was a whole thing. So that's where all the heat started to come, you know. And it was one time in a bar, and that's all it fucking takes. I always tell guys, that's all it takes, man. It's one time, there's guys sitting in prison for life for hitting a guy one time. He falls down and dies. You know, it's like, you got to be smart, man. You got to be real fucking smart about what situations you put yourself in. How much were you drinking? I was slamming it, man. I was, I was getting after it. Blacked out for sure. Like a lot, almost every night. Like if, if I was drinking, I was blacking out. You know, that's just how it was going down. What was that with? Fucking name it, bro. It was, yeah. it, it was <clears throat> shots, you know, slamming shots at the bar, fucking vodka, just, just, no governor did at you, all did you become an alcoholic no because i i would say some of these alcoholics is like kind of relies on it kind of like looking at man i go months like we, we'd deploy i wouldn't touch alcohol for seven months not even think about it it was just like when i wanted to party i would get after it mm -hmm. what was it like going to your first mission <sighs> it was man it felt great it felt great we went to yemen so it was just growing a beard and getting weird we were in civilian clothes off grid living in a small camp doing it wasn't super hot but it was you know you were out there training a counterterrorism unit and doing stuff and it was just felt good to be working man and just in that job in that space it felt great when was the first time you came under attack no we never got we never got any never. issues that, no we never had any issues like that there because we were it wasn't they had issues with the houthis and all that stuff but we were kind of doing some more specialized stuff you know we were we were doing security for the ambassador in in mm. things like that so it wasn't like taking heavies did like, you ever go to any war zones yeah we went to iraq so oh, i went to iraq two years later so i went to iraq two years later and that was a different situation right because we're dealing we're dealing with al-qaeda arabian peninsula which was in yemen and then we're but we're doing foreign internal defense which is training indigenous forces and so that was a little bit slower and then in iraq you know isis is there we're on the front line of troops we're building out a fob prep meeting with the sunni tribal fighters who had been displaced by isis so we're taking rockets and taking different stuff but that wasn't it wasn't crazy you know it wasn't like fallujah and those guys were getting after you know doing house clearances and close quarters it wasn't like that 
What was it like though, being under attack for the first time? Was it a sense of adrenaline or were you scared? No, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any issues. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but it's the men, it's the the method of thinking of people yeah. like I've interviewed SCS, SBS, snipers that they, tap differently. Mm. To bond, obviously, you're trained to be calm under that fucking pressure. But did you not even sense any sort of emotion? I was fine, man. I was. Did they take that? I was out? finally. Ha I was happy, man, to finally be getting shot at. To be quite honest. Why do you think that is? I don't know, man. Uh, I don't know. It was just like finally being able to do the job. That's what it felt like. Mm -hmm. And did you lose lose many brothers? No, a little. That that our platoon was good. We didn't have any issues. Platoon after us lost a lost a good guy. How is that when you see brothers dying? Man, it's it's surreal because what 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 a lot of people also don't realize is in the special operations community, and any guy in it will will understand this. People think about combat, but people don't realize how many people die in training. That's like the other side that you don't realize. Most die in training, a lot. And that was weird to see. I mean, you'd have two, three guys die a year. Your homies dying from skydiving, dying from underwater shit. And that that happened a lot. That's why people think combat, but that was like not where it happens most of the time. Yeah, combat, that's what you've signed up for, to die. Yeah. But to do it in basic training, man, it must be difficult to see. It's it's rough seeing guys go like that because it's always the good guys. It's always mm -hmm. the fucking really, for whatever reason, man, I get the chills thinking about it because it's always the guys that are like, you know, that example of what it should be. And it's like kind of a weird moment. How was it looking back in Iraq now? Because being patriotic is a noble thing. Want to fight for your country, do the right thing. And then it comes out, there's no weapons of mass destruction and so many people let, lose, lose their life for no reason. How is that when you see Man, that? I wouldn't say it's like for no reason because you're fighting for the guy next to you, not you know, yeah. not, not for some bigger geopolitical, let's be quite honest. Because that's what it turns into. <laughs> it turns into you're fighting for your, your brother and fuck all the geopolitical. Who the fuck really knows what's going on? Nobody, yeah. you know, that's kind of, that's kind of where it goes. Did you ever question that though? Why you're here and what you're fighting for? I would, I would, I would question maybe a little bit. I would question it more though, when we'd be so restricted on what we were able to do, you know, we'd have targets, we'd see, we'd have guys that we could take out and they were not approved. Things like that. It was like, why are we here if we're actually, if we're not having any approvals and that, that's what affects troop morale the most mm -hmm. is having your hands tied. Who calls the shots and what's the daily routine like? Is it different every single day in Iraq or is it all regimented, quick, kind of the same thing? Ours is pretty, uh, with with the SEAL community and special operations community in general, special force community, you're usually kind of isolated in these in these areas and you, you're on 24 hour security. You know, you're holding your own security. That's what people don't realize. So you got guys on the roof 24 hours a day. Two guys are up in the camp 24 hours a day minimum. So everyone, you, everyone's got a job, you know, and you all have specialties, communications, the vehicles. So everyone's got their program. You meet up for meetings in the mini tactical operations center to go over stuff. You'll be going out on trainings. You'll be going out on missions. There'll be different briefings. But you're a tight-knit group. I mean, there's only 15 guys there, 20 guys there max. Sometimes in Yemen, it was less. It was about 10 guys. Mm -hmm. So you're tight-knit. And you have your meetings and then guys break off and do their own thing, you know? So it's not like hardcore regimented military. It's big boy rules. What's the worst thing you've seen while you're in the Navy SEALs? <sighs> Man, dude. I would say uh, they shot rockets at our camp one time and they missed, right? And they landed in the village next to us. So we went over there to kind of see what the deal was and they had killed some little kids. You know, so that was that was pretty brutal, and you know they want us to help the boys first and shit like that, and it's like that part's rough. How do you go over that? Is that where the drug the the drink comes in? No, for me it's not that. I just I um that's just unfortunate. You know, that's just unfortunate. But it's not like I never turned to something to numb that stuff, or at least I didn't think so. Mm -hmm. When did you start getting into bother? Then that night you punched someone. That was the night everything changed for you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> do you think it was always going to happen though because you were in so many fights in prison since you were 16 it was only a matter of time before something more serious happened <sighs> it was only a matter of time i was playing with fire so so long 
but I wasn't out getting in fights all the time, really. If it hadn't been, it hadn't been for years, I'd re- we'd get in little scuffles, you know, as a group, you know, whatever it happens. But this was just, it, it, man, it was just a dumb move. It was unnecessary, and I sent it, and I paid for it, man. Yeah. What happened? What happened when you punched the guy? He just went down like a sack of potatoes. His orbital eye socket broke, so he almost lost his eye. That was that was what what happened. So he had to get surgery. Had to pay for everything. It was a whole thing, man. Mm-hmm. When were you at your happiest when you were doing this stuff? What in war zones or protecting people, fighting for your brothers or fighting in bars? When were you? Did you ever feel happy? That's a great question. You know, I actually thought about this the other day when I was at my most happy. For, I'm at my happiest right now, thank God. But you know, that's <laughs> but during that time. It was right when I graduated, right when I finished SEAL training and everything was still fresh and not complicated yet. We hadn't had friends die and like things were fresh and new. That was cool. And then right before, right around the time I hit that guy, right? This is interesting. Right around that time I hit that guy, things were peaking again. They were like really good. I was getting early promotes and getting all these accolades at work. Then that happened. And then two years later, same day almost, same fucking day, I get in another altercation. This is not a fight, but it's a, this is, that was the nail in the coffin. What got me kicked out of the SEAL teams was two years later. And I was at my happiest at that, the day before that happened. I remember it specifically because I was in the shower going, I had found a new love. I was like in love. And I was, everything was building back because I had just cleared up all that shit. It took me two years. And I was like, man, I fucking feel great. The next next day I was in jail again. Mm-hmm. How is that though? When It's not a self-sabotage kind of thing, but <clears throat> when you're doing that and things seem going, as if they're going good, there's always something chapping at the door to say, you don't deserve this. And then something bad happens. Man, it, it was self-sabotage. And you know what the self-sabotage rooted in? I had to really think about this for a long time. It's 100% lack of self-worth. You know, it's 100% lack of self-worth because I knew I wasn't living in alignment. I wasn't doing all the things I should be doing. I wasn't holding discipline. So there's that, you don't deserve this, man. It's going to fucking, the other shoe's going to drop. You you nailed it on the head with that. I think it's 100% subconscious, poor self-talk. What about relationships? How hard is it for someone in the military to be in love, especially with the stuff that they see in the alcohol. Man, they say they say in the special operations community the divorce rate's 135%, <laughs> including second marriages. <laughs> it's hard, bro, because, man, we were gone. As a single guy, man, I was gone 270 days a year, not deployed, training, just living in hotels and shit. That puts strain on. Some guys can pull it off, but it's the rare cat, like rock solid moral compass, really good chick, they are like bonded. I know I can put up maybe on one hand for real, yeah. for real that can pull that shit off successfully. Do you think it's easier being single then? Oh, it's a single man's game. A lonelier journey though. It's a single man's game and there's pros and cons with that, right? You're not mm-hmm. as locked up, but it's a single man's game and almost any guy in that world will agree. What was your mom saying when you were in the Navy? Was she happy for you? She loved it. She pr- uh, proud for sure. You know, and at the time my sister was married to a seal also. So it was like, we had a pretty, uh, like when seal team seven deployed her son-in-law and her son would deploy at the same time, you know, and my sister's husband would be gone. It'd be like a whole thing. You must be competing like fuck against each other, like board games or Christmas or man. <laughs> there must be fucking Dr- murder in your drinking house. at Christmas <laughs> time, man. Yeah. Fuck yeah. having a fight man. in that house. You know, yeah, but but like again, that marriage disintegrated, mm-hmm. you know? So like it didn't last. And um it it's a difficult world. It's a difficult world to stay in for sure, just physically, mentally mm-hmm. for sure. What's the hardest part about being in the military? In the military in general, it's time gone. It's just time gone. You need to be, you need to have face time with people to maintain bonds and mm-hmm. just all that de- time demanded away is because you don't, you have no autonomy. You're, yeah, you're going, you're going. How long were you in for before you get kicked out? Seven years and some change. So a big chunk of your life, mm-hmm. you've put everything into it to die for your country, fight for your brothers to then one incident punching a man yeah 
nearly fucking killing him. Was in a coma. That's well, it was. It was that I fixed that. I actually beat that whole case, and I got reinstated fully. And I went to Iraq even after that. Mm -hmm. And then two years later, I fucking got in a golf cart that wasn't mine. Dead serious. This is how it happens at a Jimmy Buffett concert. <laughs> Wasting away. <laughs> and I'm dead serious. That was on the thing. I get picked up by the cops. They sick a dog on me. I have a huge chunk out of my ass from it. <laughs> I have to, they tase me three times to get me on the ground. And that that's how easily it goes from, I lost my SEAL career because I got in a fucking golf cart that wasn't mine. Dead serious. And it was because then I, then I fled. Then the cops try to check me. Then I'm beating off a dog. So it's snowballed off of something so s fucking stupid. Mm -hmm. And that was the nail on the head because I was on probation. Now I violated my probation on another violent crime. I had federal marshals in a van trying to extradite me from the state. It was three lawyers in two states hemorrhaging cash, fighting all this shit. Had to go to jail again the second time as an active duty Navy SEAL with the top secret clearance. I went to jail two times in Idaho. So then they kicked me out, right? What was it like getting tasered? Man, dude, they tased me once and I pulled it out. They tased me twice and I pulled it out. It was one of the ones they go, you know, they shoot you. And I pulled it out and then they tased me a third time and it, and it was in the middle of my back and I couldn't get it. And then they hit me with that fourth one and it fucking put me down hard, man. <laughs> Fuck, but you're a big strong man. Yeah, they, like, they must have been shitting themselves. Well, that's why they that's why they actually got kicked me out because the Navy JAG, the Judge Advocate General, which is they 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 looked over, they're like, there's no way this guy's not on performance enhancing drugs. Because I was actually gonna beat that case too. So they performance enhanced steroid tested me. They sent it up to this expensive ass lab and I fucking lit that motherfucker up, man. I was I popped hot on like <laughs> three, four things. And so they it's zero tolerance, zero tolerance. They look at it as like drugs because it's not approved. So that's what actually got me kicked out was steroid use, performance enhancing drug use. You got me kicked out of the medical. I thought a majority of them are on anyway. Man, that's if maybe if you can get it approved from a doctor from testosterone, but I was on other that's shit it. too. And, and it was off the books, man. <laughs> <laughs> Lit up like fucking Las Vegas. You know, yeah. Is that, do you think that's part of the reason why you went a bit loopy? Possibly, possibly. Absolutely. It definitely wasn't stabilizing my my psychology, 100%. So all this happened, so you've done more shit, got away with that. Yeah. But then it stemmed from being drunk in a golf cart. Yep. What was the dog bite like? Man, dude, fucking <laughs> a motherfucker, dude. It was like, <laughs> see, I get bit by razor blades, man. I got him off, though. You've been shot at, fucking missiles, <laughs> missing you, tasered four times, but the dog was I think about that guy. Every time I look at my ass, man, I, I got a nice little chunk. What sort of dog was that? German Shepherd. Yeah, yeah, they're ruthless. Yeah, yeah. They're fucking ruthless. Yeah. So is that when everything changed then? Yeah. How long did it take to go to court? Yeah, so that that process, the court process, pretty quick, but then it bled into the other state charge because I had a probationary term. So it's not military court. It's not like a well, it was court. both. It was both. So I had two different courts going on. So, long story short, it took me about seven months for that whole process to get complete, to get finalized. I went to jail back in Idaho, and then by the time I walked out of jail, I had my discharge papers and I was out of the military. What was it like in jail? So it wasn't an army jail then. No, I went to civilian jail twice. What was that like? It was all right. I mean, it, it's a mixed bag of guys because it's county jail. So it's not prison, right? So it's, but that can be kind of bad and good. You don't have any yard time. So no sunlight, no yard time. It's full lockdown. Mm -hmm. And it's guys going to federal prison. It's guys on serious violent tri crimes. It's guys who are on drug crimes. So it's a mixed bag. So that can get a little weird. What are you thinking then when you're in prison? possibly getting kicked out not got fuck all else to fall back on yeah was that a stressful time in your life to be quite honest I, but when i was in jail i was actually kind of fucking happy to be clearing the shit up i was actually kind of in a good mood and i had set some shit up so i had set used my contacts and i set a pretty good gig up when i knew i was getting out mm -hmm. and i went into private residential development so i went into actually building homes uh, as a supervisor and that took a super lateral left, but that's kind of what I went into right out of the military. What was it like getting kicked out of the military? That I almost just shelved it. And this leads perfectly into that. What happened next is I just shelved it like, okay, that happened. 
And immediately, day I got out of the military, I started stacking bad habits, stacking them. The day I got out, Adderall, Xanax, weed, alcohol, every fucking day. I didn't miss a day. No, no Sunday off because I was actually functioning and I was actually being successful too, which is, that was the dangerous part is I could lie to myself uh, because I'm like, look at me, man. I got the beautiful girlfriend, the house by the beach, fucking a great job. I'm crushing it. Nobody can tell me shit, man. Mm -hmm. And so then I just kept doing it. I kept doing it. It's working, obviously. You know, I wasn't drinking at work, but I was like eating Adderall in the morning to get going. Then I was, okay, eating Xanax a little bit later. Now I'm at the gym, taking the edge off <laughs> with a bottle of vodka at like 5 p.m., right? And I'm like, is this starting to like, all these things are starting to build that I wouldn't have done before. Definitely mm -hmm. not in the seals. Mm -hmm. And now I'm smoking weed every night. Not the same, that's, that's the worst thing, but it was just all these things. And then a year later, I moved into a different job. Doesn't, you know, doing some venture capitalist type ventures with somebody and I stacked on an opioid habit on top of it. So that was, now I was doing that all night. And then getting up and doing Adderall to get up in the morning. And, and that that was, so two years were going on with this. And the relationship struggling, you know, you, you can't bend reality that long doing that type of shit. And I didn't. And I went face down, literally smashed my fucking whole head open on like a, a, a table, was fired, you know, was fired from the job. I was crushing it. And now I was the CEO of this thing. And now I'm fired you know he the guy said something he's like you were an asset now you're a liability that fucking stung i never forgot that that was so well put it was exactly the truth i was getting speed wobbles and i went down hard and that's when to answer your question james was when i lost everything and i was homeless in my truck dead serious i had all this stuff all these titles was flying a thousand miles an hour the next thing i know i, I realized I fucking have nowhere to go and I have no money. That was like the weirdest, I had never experienced that and I'm not a SEAL anymore. That was the, took me two years, two fucking years to come to that realization. And that's when I was like, I'm gonna smoke myself. And that's when I was thinking about killing myself for three days. I had a sawed off shotgun on my lap and I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my life. This is, I can't fucking do this shit anymore. Like I'm tired of trying to be successful. And that's, that's the state I was in for, for a little bit there. How was that then from 16, in and out of trouble, drinking, you're kind of getting away with it, you're only a young kid, you're doing your thing, Navy SEAL kind of put the plaster over it as well, you're doing something with your life, but you still had that inner demon, mm -hmm. you still had that fucking devil, it was only a matter of time before, listen, <clears throat> the saving grace is it was such a silly thing with the golf cart, but even then, it could have been fucking somebody's life. 100%. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's the route you were going down. Oh yeah. It's killer be killed. Yep. And, and when it all adds up, you've been let go from the Navy SEALs, the military, you've not got anything, you didn't want to admit it, too yep. much pride, too much yep. ego, I'm fine, drinking drugs, numbs mm -hmm. the pain, no matter, it destroys everybody else around us, and then bang, it comes to a head, yep. and then what do we want to do? We want to take our own life. How was that feeling? Big, strong man, <sighs> no fear, fear of nothing, but yet doesn't want to fear life. <sighs> Man, that was such a a powerful moment. That was like a religious experience. It was, it was, I had to get honest with myself for the first time ever that I wasn't happy with who I was, right? I had been so deliberate about what I wanted to do my whole life, but never deliberate about who I wanted to be, ever. And I still wasn't sure who I wanted to be at that moment. But then I had that moment of clarity that higher consciousness, God, whatever anybody wants to call it. I had this moment where it was like, you fucking pussy. <laughs> you're thinking about yourself all. That's all you're doing. You have a mom, you have a sister. What's their life going to look like if you do this? And I had this like moment. I was like, man, dude, like I am just sitting out here in my pity party. <laughs> just like, fuck that. I'm going to the French Foreign Legion. That's exactly how that happened. And I was like, I'm fixing this shit right now. I was like, I'm not gonna just sit here and wallow anymore. There's nothing holding me back. How close were you to pulling the trigger? I was thinking about different ways for a while. I was like, I was thinking about jumping off a cliff and then I realized it probably wasn't high enough. 
and I just get really hurt. And then I was like, well, there's a volcano near me. I was like, I could jump in a volcano. And dead serious. <laughs> and that kind of brought me out. I laughed at myself. I'm like, bro, I'm out here thinking about wild shit. I'm like, you're, that's, that's honestly me say having that thought was what brought me kind of out of like, you fucking pity part, jump yeah. in a volcano. Like you're, you're fucking insane. Fit, clean it up, bro. Like that's what I was yeah. like, clean it the fuck up. <laughs> and so, man, that's, that's, that was the, the situation I was in psychologically. But the minute I, I always say, if, when guys are having a hard time, fucking make, just pick something and go. Doesn't need to be perfect. Doesn't, you don't need to know exactly how it's going to get done. To only get out of that pit is you have got to pick something and just start moving. And yeah. that's like, wh that's what felt good for a minute is I had another goal to actually, sh okay, start moving towards. Yeah, as long as you keep going forward. So it's, have it's, to. It's okay stopping. It's okay stopping, taking a little breather. You have to. Don't go back. Because if you go back, then that's when all the fucking negatives kick in and that's when your life becomes in danger. Because yeah. you feel as if there's no progress. You feel as if there's no no purpose. And, and Hopelessness. Things. Yeah, and it's, it's a scary feeling and the majority of the world feel like this. Not just men anymore, women feeling scared, feeling hopeless, feeling in fear, mm -hmm. feeling that if other people are better, other people are living their life, social media plays a big part, but that's just the way it is. So you've hit rock bottom, you've lost everything, you've got fuck all, you've got addictions everywhere, mm -hmm. you're ready to kill yourself. Why the foreign legion? I had, it had come on my radar when I thought I couldn't get in the United States military. Okay, I had that as an option, emergency option. And then, man, I have fucking, not, what else was I gonna do, right? That's kind of where I was. What else do I do? I, didn't, I was good with a gun. I knew I was good with that. Then I also had this piece like, man, I want to write an interesting story, right? If I'm going to do something, I'm going to make it fucking cool. And so I was like, I had never heard of a Navy SEAL being the Foreign Legion. Had never heard of it. So I'm like, man, I'll do that shit. That's me. And so that's what I did. And so I, eight days later, I was in France at that gate of the, at the Fort Nogent. And nearly anybody, is that correct, from 18 to 39? Is that a myth? No, that's absolutely true. Why is that? 18 to 39 and a half. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but Ranger fucking I'm, crazy. I'm, I'm, it's a fascinating institution for anybody that's not aware of what it is. It's, you know, almost a couple hundred years old. It was started by an old king and it was to funnel foreigners he had in bars causing trouble in, in the streets who had fought in a previous war back onto the battlefield to get them out of the streets back onto the battlefield and he gave them the carrot of French citizenship if they served their time. Kind of like the old Roman legions. If they served their 17 years, they would get French citizenship. It was like that. That's where the idea came from. So anybody can join and it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You can go knock on those legion doors. There's two main pre-selection centers and a couple satellite spots, but really the two main pre-selection centers. You can go knock on the door Christmas day if you wanted. And they'll, a guy with a gun will open the door and let you in. That's fucking crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. But the French have always been crazy. Yeah, they're crazy. They're not right in the fucking <laughs> head, man. That's, they're not right in the head. So that was your last option to, why did you still want to be some sort of military? Why? What was that purpose? I had painted myself into a corner again. I thought I had no money. I had no latitude. I, I knew at least I would be covered, right? If I could get there, I'll make it. Well, I thought I was hoping I'd make it. It just, I had, the story I told myself was that I had no other option. Mm -hmm. I may, may have, but I in my head, I didn't. So what's the steps to get into the Foreign Legion? You go with your bag, with a super streamlined bag, and go knock on that door and hand the guy your fucking passport. There's no calling ahead. There's no setting an appointment. And then he tells you to get up on the pull-up bar. It's like the first thing that you do. And you do that. They go, okay, get down. Then they're going to give you a real preliminary IQ test. And then they're going to let you chill for a little bit. And then you immediately get grouped up in, well, you know, a room full of guys from fucking Mongolia, Belarusia, Ukraine, Colombia. It's fascinating to be in a room with that many languages spoken. What, the Olympics, maybe you're going to come into something like that. Really, really weird situation, unique. And then they're going to start processing you. They're going to do medical evaluations, psychological profiles, so psychological interviews, background, hardcore, you know, interrogations, for lack of a better word. 
are you who you say you are? That's what their biggest concern is. They don't want guys coming in with sexual crimes. They don't want guys coming in with huge issues with Interpol, arms trafficking and shit. So they're, and it's happened, man, a lot. So they're really, they, they don't fuck around. They're, to kind of give you some numbers, one out of 15 guys that come and knock on that gate will get selected. Mm-hmm. One out of 15. But that's easy numbers for you to pass the Navy SEALs for the numbers that actually started well, that. So, but so for the Foreign Legion, <clears throat> because you, do you not become like a ghost? Do they not like change your name? They do. So people who was on the run for murder or yeah. arms dealing or drug dealing, it's perfect for them to slip through the net. Oh, yeah. How, how, how um, intense is it though to pass all those tests for, for them to do the background checks and say, okay, you're clear? Well, one out of 15, well, you know, so uh, do, does, that's a, not a great number percentage wise. Is that one out of 15 people who failed training also are the background checks? No, that's just just, just background checks and interviews. So that's only one in 50. Okay, and I medical. thought it was the full. No, full no, that's training. just background checks and interviews. How so, many pull-ups? Man, I think I think they want to see at least 10. But, you know, so it's not crazy. But, you know, I did like 20 or 30. <laughs> Were you going in good shape? Were you yeah, off? Yeah, man, I've always trained. Even yeah, when you off the drugs and shit. So that's actually a good question. So I had kicked the opioids Mm -hmm. right before so i was like okay i got that down but i'm still drinking and doing adderall and all that stuff every day and smoking weed so when i got to france i gave myself i was like i need a week to clean my system out detox and that's what i did so i just cut everything we tried to go on some runs and stuff and just lived in a shitty ass hostel and Mm -hmm. and just drank water man (laughs) just pissed it all out so what about background checks so if you've been in prison if you've been kicked out of the military they're okay with that. Yeah, man. I have another boy, a homie, who had, was, he's the only other special force guy. He was a Marine Raider. He's the only other guy in the French Foreign Legion who was also special operations before. And awesome, awesome fucking bro. He had a an issue with a gun charge. It wasn't him. He sold a gun. And then he, so he had a felony, technically. You come in. You can have felonies come into the French Foreign Legion. It's Okay. They just want to know what kind of felony and are you honest about it? So it's like a fucking army for the lost souls. Yeah, man. It, and some guys get in with crazy charges, <laughs> kidnapping and stuff. But if, if the guy's like, man, if you really own it, they want to see you own that shit because you can't get better if you don't know where you're at, right? It's like getting lost in the woods. They can't fix you if you're in denial, about and that's that goes with everything right that goes with so and the legion's no different the guys are interview if you're trying to brush it off or saying oh well it wasn't me it was i was in the wrong yeah they're gonna fucking right out if you're like hey i've made some dumb fucking choices and now i'm here i want to change my life they'll give you not they'll give you a chance is that what it's like it seems like a like a, a rehab for it i mean some guys also it's not even guys who are just hardcores there's guys going there for the money too coming from real poor countries i mean you don't get paid shit but you got guys coming from real poor countries mm-hmm. they're ma- they're making it rain when they go home with that legion salary you know what mm-hmm. i mean it's great they seriously man you know that that exchange rate works we're real it doesn't work for us going the other way mm-hmm. but it works it works for some guys and uh and some for the nationality right because some their passport's so weak they they want to get that french nationality and get that european fucking tag and then they can mm-hmm. get in it's like the fucking military for the, it's like a rehab for the military insane. The ones who are naughty, the ones who are in prison, charges yeah. everywhere. And they just accept tattoos, convictions. Man, you got guys coming in with faces tatted and heads, bro. <laughs> who run, who, so who operates it then? Who's the, the leaders of it? So technically. Is it the government? Yeah, technically it's the French. It's, it's, it's very u- uniquely gray legally, right? Because when I got in, they gave me a fake name. They gave me a fake European social security number with a fucking passport for France, official passport that I deployed on my first deployment to South America, the, the Amazon jungle doing interdiction of gold mines and shit on a fake name. I don't have a passport with it's just, it's wild. And you can keep that name if you want. I had, if you want your old name back in your passport, you have to route additional pass paperwork up. Mm-hmm. It comes back. They do additional background checks and shit like that. And then you can get your real name back, which I did. But some guys, they just want to stay the ghost, man. See, when you're doing the psychological stuff, what, what was your reports? 
Were you passed, clear? Like, man, they must have fucking been like, this guy's awesome, man. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 got, I, I got the high score, bro. I think I broke this. I broke the machine. Uh -huh. I got the high score, bro. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I think military wise, my psychological profile is pretty good. Like, mm. I know how to soldier. I know how to answer the questions. They they know what they're getting with me. Yeah, they would have seen that. You're there for the job. Yeah, You're yeah, the they, perfect soldier. Yeah, they, they're I like, this guy's good to go. So my my psychological profile is actually pretty. Even stable. Kill. Even, even, pretty if you, stable. even if you weren't, they would have fucking yeah. stamped it anyway because you've got what possibly, for. possibly. You know, and I brought my paperwork, so they knew who I was coming in, and I wanted them to. Mm -hmm. So, see, what's the training like? So, you pass all those tests, you do the pull-ups, you're in a room with I've so I've so many different backgrounds. What sort of training do you do? As we're kind of moving into the actual yeah. military training and, and the physical training, they start testing more. And the French Foreign Legion runs, man. They are runners. They're not run through deserts and they do run. some mad shit. They run, bro. Man, they rain or shine, man. They're out there running. And, <laughs> and I'm not, right? So it was uh, challenging. But, you know, you're doing all basic military stuff first. You're doing an Army basic boot camp. But now there's that language piece thrown in, which adds an interesting flavor of difficulty because military orders are done in French. And nobody speaks French. So that creates some issues, creates some friction and some, some difficulties. But you work through it and everybody's got this catch-all in French. And we work through it, started learning the how you maneuver and make calls in French. And then you start going into the physical training, you know, and they're, they're doing a lot of body calisthenics and stuff like that, but you're out shooting and doing all that stuff. I went to a mountain specialty. So I was doing a mountain warfare specialty. So we're doing a lot of stuff in the mountains in, in winter and summer. What was more difficult, the Navy SEALs or the Foreign Legion? S selection. Yeah. SEAL training. Okay. Much harder. It's longer also. Mm -hmm. And in the Foreign Legion, the psychological problem is way, way worse. In what it's, sense? You're feeling isolated. You know, everyone's got that feeling of aloneness. You're not with your bros. You're, it's a harsh environment also. It's very, it's more prison-like than, so it's not fun. <laughs> and it's that you're fighting through that and feeling of loss, that feeling of loss that you're there and what am I doing here? That a lot of guys have that. So you have a desertion problem also. Guys will just say, fuck this, I can't take it. And it's a pressure cook. It's, a, it's an institution that's built around, like you said, they got all these lost souls coming. So how do you get those guys? You put them under a fucking heavy thumb, a real heavy thumb. Like you walk across the grass wrong in the Legion. They're putting you in fucking jail. And I'm not even really exaggerating. They're hardcore. Your movements are all reported. You're not going out of the base without reporting and getting cards and checks in like, your autonomy is very minimal. So that creates an, uh, another level of pressure. And that's all your whole contract. That doesn't end at boot camp. That's five years of that. That's, that's good for you, though, because that's discipline that you never had away from all the bad stuff. Man, I, man, I, I didn't fucking. Well, the truth was, it was nice for the time, but after like the first year, I didn't need that. It was actually, I needed more. And so I started instituting more discipline on myself. Like if they would set the wake up time at five, I'll get up at three. And I'd work out in the bathroom and I started like instant. That's when the something clicked when I realized the only way to my salvation and my inner peace and clarity is to just fucking crush myself on discipline and just never miss. So that's what I started to do in the Legion when I started to kind of see the light. Do you regret not doing that in the Navy SEALs? I don't regret anything. Well, I shouldn't say that. I regret things in my life, but man, I just wasn't there yet. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't regret it. I wish, it, I don't, I don't want to wish my life away. I should have been more responsible to, for my teammates, for my team, for my, and just been less selfish. That's what I, that's what I really would have liked to have been less selfish and had a better, more mature understanding of the situation. I was just seeing it like, yeah, I'm going out and party, but I didn't look at it like, hey, if I get in trouble here, I'm going to cause a bunch of fucking problems for the team, for my leadership, for all these people that are trying to get mission readiness. And that that's what I wish I would have seen. Mm -hmm. So once she is a five-year contract, you need to stay there for five years, no matter what? Yeah. Well, yeah, the, technically, yes. And what's that feeling then? So what happens if you people didn't want to be there? They fucking desert. They man. go AWOL. Yeah. Yeah, they go home. And then it is what it is. You know, it's it's a unique thing. And it's a big problem in the Legion. What's, not, what's that like then fighting for another country? 
Was that not weird, or was it just you? Just, you just wanted to fight. Do you think? Yeah, I'm, I, I've had moments where it's where people have posed me questions, and I, was, I mean, my loyalty is the United States, right? I mean, well, my loyalty is the United States. It's just it, it'd be the UK or the United States if there's an issue. So I would never have that like that conflict. You what know, happens I, if that if American France went into war? I'd imagine they would have to kick you out. But what happens if somebody says because obviously you'd have been a spy or yeah. whatever? But how would that how would that then happen? Yeah, somebody asked me that question the other day, man. I don't know, man. That that's a that's a heavy thing to think about, obviously, because you know there's those alliance ties for so long, man. I don't. I mean, they the geopolitical scenario seen in the Legion is unique because Ukraine just happened, right? Mm -hmm. We have Russians and Ukrainians in the Legion. A lot. So that that wasn't, but it was seamless, really seamless. They let the Ukrainian guys go home. A lot of them went home to fight. And, you know, they let they give they gave them time to go get their families and shit. And some just stayed and fought. So and then they can come back to Legion if they want. It's wild, man. That's fucking nuts. Yeah, man. So you get Russians, Ukrainians, but they're fighting for France, but yet France let them go and fight for their own country. Yeah, well, they let them go for a little bit, and some guys just didn't come back, but they're like, hey, you could come back if... How many people was in them? How in, many people was in the Foreign Legion? It was about 8,000, 7,500. Everyone's strong, mad, kind of up for it? Man, everyone's pretty good, but it, the Le French Foreign Legion is a one-stop shop for France. They don't outsource anything. So the French Foreign Legion in that 7,500 guys has their own tanks, has their own medical staff, has their own administrative staff, their own cooks, their own security, their own parachute regiments, mountain regiments, engineering regiments, mm -hmm. combat divers, right? They don't outsource shit, so they need all types. They need guys slanging an A-dub and guys working in the kitchen, right? So they need that whole spectrum. So not everyone's a machine of war like me, you know, or some Belarusian you see, you know, but... That, so they they have a nice spread because you got guys there who just want the nationality and the money you know they want a better life for their family or whatever yeah who's the toughest boys you came across what country man i would say slovakians belarusians and um yeah those are the, the two groups are pretty tough. you got a lot of tough brazilians also obviously I was, the russians and the polish and stuff they're just tough bastards. Yeah. They're just that, some fucking different. Yeah. The po we don't have a lot of poles. There used to be a lot more poles, but every pole I've met's tough as shit. And um, the Slovakians are all big and tough. Scottish. <laughs> man, we <laughs> got to come we, across we got a Yeah, we got a couple good Scots, man, and they're always funny as shit, man. <laughs> good good no What You want to know something interesting? Yeah. The oldest guy, the oldest guy in the French army is a legionnaire. And he's a Scottish dude. He's badass too, yeah, bro. Love he's that. crushing it, bro. I think in the, in the SCS selection as well, it's the majority of the Scottish that pass. Really? So I don't know what the fuck it is. Tapped something. Yeah. Maybe fighting for years. I don't know. Yeah, you guys got that old school fucking yeah. battle axe jeans, yeah, bro. Crazy. Did you see that though with a lot of people as well, where they were brought up, you thought, okay, he's tough? What I really started to see was the guys who grew up real poor. You know, those guys have a different mindset mm -hmm. of what's tough. You know, especially you got those guys that grew up poor in Ukraine, you know, and or poor in wherever. Their, their level of what is considered bad and good is different than some guy who's who's just had it easy his whole life, you know, that they're they're like, This isn't bad. How long have you done now? Is it four years, five years? How yeah, I'm almost, I'm coming up on my end, my my end of my contract, man. I'm pretty much on terminal leave now. So you're allowed to speak out and stuff and do your videos? Yeah, well, <laughs> you're doing it anyway. I got a little friction. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Did you? Yeah, because I thought it was going to be. So I kind of game plan. I was like, man, I want to help people. I want to get like kind of this message out. So, but I had to get right first, and I still had moments where I wasn't fucking perfect. And then I just at one time. Like, last year it was like look i'm locking it on i can't help anybody if i'm not 100 percent, right and it's going to be it'll show i'm not authentic i'm not living how i'm i preach so then i just started to do that then when i was so clear and was really experiencing this mental clarity and this inner peace and i was like you know this okay i gotta figure it out i cracked the fucking code i know how to do this and i built out a system which i show guys it's a daily system but I was like, part of it, you got to get your face out there. You got to be talking. 
man. You gotta, people gotta know who you are. So I pushed record on the camera and I started my, my YouTube. And I was like, oh, probably I got some time. It won't blow up right away. It'll give me some time. So right before I get out, then, then maybe I'll get some heat. It fucking blew up immediately, first video. And uh, second video got 400,000 views already. And it's not even like seven, eight weeks, right? And I'm like, okay. Then I started getting the heat. They're like, hey, <laughs> you need to take it down. So I had to be in an administrative legal battle with the Foreign Legion over it, still. Yeah. Yeah. So you and kind of- huh? argument with them just now yeah and so i'm still but because they know i'm positive on it though i'm not i'm not ripping i'm actually very grateful for these they saved my fucking life man and i yeah. say that so they understand it and so it's kind of just this cold war right now they're just kind of waiting it out i'm gonna get out soon it's all good it's all good on the up and up because they know i'm not gonna be disrespectful and so they just like he's not really saying anything bad i'm actually quite the opposite can you speak about the foreign legion when you're in though no is it frowned upon Te technically no and they're just mad because i did some of it in a uniform they just can't control the narrative they can't control the narrative which i get one day i can just fly off the handle yeah, yeah, yeah. and just say whatever so i understand their position yeah. but i also understand mine yeah you've got a fucking life to lead but yeah. they've saved your life in some degree yeah. as well so that's why i'm respectful yeah and because i because it looks good on with the uniform and stuff man and dude it looks fresh yeah, dude and yeah, i yeah. represent it well and i i speak clearly and directly about it I, and only positive stuff really because if somebody needs fucking help and they're in that that realm it it's there and it's and you can actually really you can make a career out of it if you wanted to you could do some really cool shit and guys have that option and it's a fantastic option it's unique as unique as shit mm -hmm. what's the foreign legion's purpose then if they're only such a small army it's it's a unique arm of France to be able to put foreigners places and not French citizens, mm -hmm. right? You know, so if something happens, it's not French citizens coming back in body bags, yeah. you know? So that's that's really where it started. It's the lack of political pressure of- uh, Losing their own? Yeah, you know. Where did you get deployed to? I was deployed immediately when I got to my regiment to French Guyane in South America, which a lot of people don't realize, French have territory in South America, just north of Brazil, called Guyane Francais. Mm -hmm. And we spent four months down there doing uh, deep jungle operations, doing interdiction for gold, illegal gold mines. I mean, we're hitting gold mines every other fucking day on patrols. There, are, It is prolific down there. Prolific. And small little villages out in the middle of the Amazon... <laughs> karaoke machines and shit like it, a whole bars built in the middle of the amazon they're gold mining mm -hmm. and then we were two years later then we did a interior domestic mission of france called vigi parat which is anti-terrorism and that's what the they use the french foreign legion and some french army you just patrol interior of france for like two months that's very unique in most. I don't think they do that in England. They definitely don't do it in the United States. Just guys patrolling around with assault rifles, especially foreigners. But it's a good mission. We did ours in Nice, which is fine because they had they have ter in Europe. You know the ter terrorist threat is very real, and they had a huge issue there where a bunch of people died in 2016, I believe it was what's the year. So and the French citizens love it. Hey, you know they're very nice to us. It's very cool. And then a year after that, they deployed us to the Russian border with NATO for the enhanced Ford presence battle group. And we were part of the French contingent, French foreign legion with some French army, with the English, the Danish, the Estonians all together doing, um, kind of flexing along the border of Russia in Estonia. How was that? It's fine. It was all right. A lot of, <clears throat> it was nice being able to speak English again, man, because they're like, I was always getting yelled at, Man, speak French, parlez français. Mm -hmm. Cause I'd be sick. But then they're like, hey man, we need you to speak English to these fucking guys, man, because we're working with England. So see when you're doing the Foreign Legion and it's coming to an end, how was that feeling? Fucking good. Was it? It feels great. It feels really you feel great. As man. If you've learned a lot. It feels like I'm ready. It feels and I know it because my habits are fixed, right? Even when I'm achieving some of that measures of success with this stuff, I realize like my habits are so fixed. You know, I get up at two in the morning, two. I get up at two, no matter what time I go to bed, doesn't matter. 
I go to, I do all my morning process. I'm doing push ups, hydrating. I've got it down to a system and I just don't miss. I start my work day really early and it feels good and it feels correct. That's when I know I'm right. Cause nothing, anything that changes in my life, I still am like right along with it, you know? And that's, that's when I knew I was ready. And also, I feel like I'd done what I needed to do in the military. I scratched all those itches. I got all the t-shirts. I got two really good t-shirts and I'm the only one that have done it. So I feel good about that. And I don't feel like there's much more. I had a moment where I was a couple, like last year I was thinking about going to Ukraine because I got contacts there and they're like, Hey man, you should come. And I, then I realized, bro, I'm just running from myself, right? Because I know I want to be successful in the civilian world. And the only reason I would go is because I'm, I think I can't make it. I think I couldn't make it in the civilian world, be running away from what I know I should be doing. So that's, I had that moment and I was like, look, I'm going to, I want to make this where I'm doing this and I'm going to commit. Do you feel that's what it was a lot of the time was running away from something? For a while, no, it was just stacking my experience. But then I realized that this time it would be man, I'm fucking 38, man. What am I, who am I, who am I trying to prove something to? That, that's, that's where I realized. I'm like, what the, am I trying to prove myself? Nobody gives a shit. <laughs> what am I going to go do another thing and fight for Ukraine? Like, it's not going to, nobody's going to be patting me on the back. Like, why am I trying to do it? I'm trying to please somebody that doesn't exist. And, um, and that was from that, that's, that was from that lack of self-worth. I think, you know, like I had to be doing all these things to feel appreciated or something. Mm -hmm. And then I, then that started to go away when I started just putting in that work daily on myself where I don't need exterior external validation to make me feel good. That's what I try to teach guys is they're like, Hey man, I, I, I'm not happy in my job. I want to go. You're reaching for straws, man. Like you will fail if you're reaching externally to for for fulfillment. You will fucking fail every time. Because what if that job goes away? What if what if it's a relationship? If you're you have got to be good everywhere, so you're good anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know how hard was it making the changes and coming off the drugs? That wasn't too hard because I just kind of went into that my old school military mindset. You know, and I just I I had never been a real. I'll tell you what was hard though. I will take that back. The opioids, that was a real addiction. That was a real, but the alcohol and the weed and all that, that was yeah. like one day. Opioids and fentanyl, that shit was fucking real, man. I was, I didn't realize it until I came off it. And I was like, whoa, this is like really affected my body. That was not something I wish on my worst enemy, you know? Yeah, it's the liver and the kidneys with all that shit. It was, it was like I, the best way I could describe it, somebody that hasn't experienced it, it was like, I couldn't be in my own skin. It was like, massive discomfort being in just like bleh. were you hallucinating uh i wasn't hallucinating but i wasn't sleeping so i started to hallucinate because i couldn't sleep for five days i had to take myself to the to the hospital and i was like look man i'm fucking i'm a navy seal i know what sleep dep deprivation is like i'm at maxed out but maxed out five days is when things start to get real real dangerous internally your, your body starts not processing skeletal muscle breakdown starts happen your liver, it's dangerous. And how was it then when you started coming through the other end of it? The clarity, once the fog fog of war lifted a little bit, that felt good. It kind of felt a little opening, getting rid of those opioids and stuff was that I knew it was positive because it's a fucking empty pit. You can never get enough. That's what's dangerous about that shit. And it's, you know, we see an epidemic all over the earth Hello? nowadays. It's all over every country. It's, a pit that you 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 need a little more every time every time you need a little more you need a little more and then it's then it starts to be you need a little bit more just to feel normal that's when it shit starts getting weird what about the alcohol now no i don't do you, so i you'll never see me slamming shots in a bar <laughs> ever again that's that's that shit's done for me because it's but if i'm with my mom's at a winery i'm not gonna not have a, a glass of wine right that's just and as I started to focus on, or if I'm at dinner with somebody, you know, it's like I, the approach is different. The approach is different. The, the outcomes, if it's fucking up my day or, or if I'm regretting something, something's wrong. 
And that hasn't happened in years, mm -hmm. you know? So that's, as I started focusing on the greater, the lesser started falling away, you know? I'm not drinking. Well, it doesn't fit in my macros. I have super strict regimen on my nutrition. It doesn't work. So I just, that's not working. That's not working. They start getting thrown out. You know, what I was drinking every, every fucking day. Now it's like, you know, months go by. How much has fitness saved your life? Fitness is the absolute <clears throat> touch point. It's an absolute touch point. My, and I think it should be a f fundamental for everybody with mental health. I think people start taking medication before they even start working out. It's a uh, backwards. You start working out, you're going to start feeling better. You don't have to do crazy shit. You don't have to be doing crazy stuff. You just eat a little better, eat some, get some good information. Somebody actually knows and work out a little bit and watch how your day gets better. Watch how your watch how the momentum starts picking up in your life. It's absolutely foundational for mental clarity. What's your daily routine like now? So every day I get up at two or two 15 and I go into some simple, some simple coffee and some thought, you know, I like to stay centered, no inputs from the phone, no inputs from stuff like quiet time. I don't do the red dot cold plunge and all the stuff in the morning complicated because it's not repeatable. I always like things that I can do in any hotel room or something simple. Black coffee and a floor is all I need. And then I'll go into some Mike Tyson push-ups, something to kind of get the vibration up. Then I'll go into some active, deliberate visualization for like 10, 15 minutes. It takes me 35, 40 minutes maximum for all that. But that brings me to a high level vibration. And then I might eat a little food, then go into some work, emails, stuff like that, where it's quiet. You know, it's so early that nobody else is up. And then I try to get into the gym a little bit later in the morning, eat some food, and then kind of go into the day. What should I eat like? What do you eat? I'm pretty strict on the macronutrients, so I'll track my food. I found that to be... So you're just on your protein, carbs, and fats? Yeah, I just track my protein, carbs, and fats, and I you know try to get the micronutrients good. Eat a good... I'm all about just a balanced diet. Very balanced. I don't do any kind of crazy... I tried keto, tried carnivore, and I felt terrible. I just... And I, it was hard for me to... I just didn't work for me. Maybe I wasn't doing it right, but... I found just a simple balanced diet that's low in fat and just with good with clean burning carbohydrates and protein is best. Yeah, I think that's what everybody needs to do is just touch on majority and whatever makes them feel better. Yeah. And then go with that. Because everybody's bodies are different. People telling you to go carnivore, vegan, fucking, it's, it's just crazy. Out, there's so much out there, negatives and positives. Do what's right for you. And people just got to know and they got to be consistent. Yeah. People got to be consistent. They're just not consistent enough to know what's good for them. And there's so much information, like you said, James, so much. It's overwhelming. So find somebody that you has something you want, admire, You're like how, how they flow, how they ask them what they're doing. They're a fitness person. Hey, how do you eat? They'll tell you if you, cause I had to do it. I had to reach out to somebody. I'm like, I'm a Navy SEAL legionnaire. Nobody can tell me how to train and eat. But the truth was I didn't fucking know. I didn't know. And so I reached out to somebody, paid him a bunch of money to teach me, and it worked. And my fucking energy went through the roof, and I've never looked back since. And it was so such a good call. And I found out what works for me, and that's kind of what I teach guys is just this balanced diet. But it's knowing your macronutrients too. It's specific to each person. And, and they need, if you don't know, you don't know. What's your biggest life lesson that you've learned so far? Man, that's a powerful question. Stay purpose driven. That's stay purpose driven. You have two two choices with everything. Is it in every decision? Is this pleasure driven or purpose driven? Simple. You ask yourself that question every time and you choose that purpose over pleasure, more often than not, your life's gonna be way better. Mm -hmm. What do you go forward for the future? What's your plans? I'm start so I starting the coaching. Started hitting that really hard. Got a book coming out called The Hard Way. And then we're going to maybe go on a speaking circuit. Really, I want to push how much better your life can be if you're deliberate about it, you're deliberate about your health, you're deliberate about your wellness, how much better people can be for the people in their life. When you start stripping away those vices, you know, I'm not saying to be absolutely perfection, but if you start stripping away your vices, and start subtracting things you don't need and start actually planning for that. What does what your beautiful life look like? You start planning deliberately 
and working towards it. Set those wake up times earlier than you want. Do it. Do with what the fuck you say you're going to do. Build that self-worth. People are out here in these streets, James, wanting people to listen to them. They don't fucking listen to themselves. How fucking ridiculous is that? People <laughs> demanding respect. They don't respect themselves. Fuck off, man. I do not fucking respect every person walking by. They can get fucked. <laughs> if, I know, if I look at them and I know they're not doing the fucking work, man, fuck them. You know, so I, that's what I put on. Oh if you want people to respect you, start respecting yourself. Hold yourself to a higher standard. It, you know, for me, I'd be, dude, man, if I was here in like London back in the day, man, I'd be at fucking strip club doing all this shit, man. Cause like, fuck it, man. Like, no, 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 no. But the truth is, man, I'm better than that. You know, it's, I, I'm bet I can hold myself to a better standard, be a better fucking man, feel better and stop doing shit that I regret, which is rid ridiculous. How important is discipline? Hmm? How important is discipline? It's it's pinnacle. It's absolutely required for self worth. You cannot have self worth or respect without discipline. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. Do you see that though? That everything that you've learned through the years to stay fit, to stay active, to stay away from the bad stuff, is discipline is one of the key factors to achieving something in your life. If you can't consistently push through those rises and dips in emotion which we all have and motivation discipline's the only thing that's going to get you through that which you know how many tough how, how often do, there's shit you don't want to do james every day right so it's what it's only discipline and commitment that gets you through it mm -hmm. and if, if people want to rely on motivation you're going to fuck yourself because that <laughs> is going to go away fast or it's not going to be around when you want it what's the book about can you give much away? Yeah. The, the book's about my path, the hard way. Learn, and it's, you know, that meaning, yeah, picking a hard path. <laughs> but also, you choose that hard path, you can make that hard path a lot harder mm -hmm. by making dumb choices, you know, and learning the hard way. It's much, much better to learn the easy, learn from other people's mistakes. Be the wise man that learns from other people's mistakes. Everything doesn't have to be the hard way. Choose a difficult path, but don't make it fucking extra hard. Are you still friends with old Navy SEALs? Oh, tons, man. Dude, we talk, talking about just on my... I got boys operating at the tip the tip of the spear still, you know, and still in it. They're all fucking super proud, man. They all love it because we're all super close and they know where my heart's at and what I'm all about, man, dude, because they know the dips that I've been down and they've always been there for me. You know, even when I was down, down and out, they'd still throw me that text like, hey, man, when... uh." What, what whip we taking? You know what I mean? Like, I, we got you, you know, and I, it was nice. It was nice having that, bro. Really grateful. Is that one of the best things about being in the military is the brotherhood? If you can get into a really tight unit, especially some in special operations, man, those bonds are, you are that shared hardship. It's like that Spartan gogi stuff, man. It's like so deep rooted that you, cause you can't recreate those bonds and those experiences. They're so hard. And you know what these, you see each other at your weak points. That's really the honest part is you see each other at your weakest and you know, you still love each other in that. And you, you hold each other together. Are you scared coming out of the military because it's all you've really known? No, I'm so ready. I'm so ready. And it's already set up for me so well. And I've got my, I would have been scared if I hadn't had shit set up, mm -hmm. you know, if I hadn't been working it more importantly, I would have been scared if I had knew my habits were still in shaky but they're not. So I, I'm ready now, like more than I would have thought. Yeah. I fucking love it, mate. Like, especially for where you've came from, you've done all the hardship, you've learned a lot. And now it's just about leaving motivation and trying to help others. And do you think that's a big issue with guys in the military loving life? They're now doing what they want to do. It's a big adventure, but the shit hits the fan when they came out because I do a lot of homeless work in Scotland and a lot of the boys on the street are military, ex-military. And it breaks your heart to see that, they're willing to die for their country, but yet nobody's willing to die for them. So um, do you see a lot of the struggles more when they came out of the military instead of in it? 100%. 100% because there's not that structure. But also what guys got to realize is, man, you got to build your own disciplines. So when guys will hit me up, when I'm kind of working with guys who are getting out, they go, hey, I'm about, tr about to transition out of the military. I said, fucking get on my program right now. It's going to save your fucking life. If you get out, 
And I'm talking more discipline than you had in the military. I'm talking serious wake up time, serious, get disciplined, get that structure, establish it. First of all, just better for life in general. But especially if you're purpose driven and you're a military guy, you fucking need that shit because you need that self-worth built in yourself because now you don't have that, that circumstantial scenario self-worth where you're with a group and you can point to the group as part of your self-worth. That's cut away now. You have got to be good by yourself and you're not going to be good by yourself until you're proud of yourself. Mm -hmm. is that, what is the program for people who don't know? What is your program? Dude, I call it the deliberate life program, but I put guys on three or six month programs or a year. They can go on a year and it's exactly my schedule. I put them on ex wake up time, supplements, how you eat, their proper macros, proper nutrition, everything we go over and then we do FaceTimes where we break down like what they're doing in their day. What actually is their plan, right? Because everyone's plan's different. What's their 10.0 self look like? We habitually construct that guy. That's what we do. We habitually construct their beautiful life, their vision, and their 10.0 self every day. We write it down. You read it. You do all these fucking steps. If it's not getting you where you're needing to go, it's fucking hurting you then get rid of it, right? And that includes relationships, that includes anything. Mm -hmm. How do people get involved in your program for people that's watching just now that's maybe in that rut? Yeah, <clears throat> if, if you have lost your mojo and you, you feel a little lost, fucking contact me. I will save your fucking life, I guarantee it. TaylorCavanaugh.com, they can go on my website. You can always get a, you can always, uh, get a hold of me there. DM me on Instagram, TCAVOfficial. Or you can drop me a comment or something on my YouTube, TCAV TV. But it's best through the website, taylorcavanaugh.com or a DM, TCAV official on Instagram. For anybody watching, brother, that's in that life of struggle and pain and suicidal thoughts or battling with addiction, what advice would you have for them? Stop doing too much. Stop, listen, and look around. Take a fucking inventory of your life. If you're feeling like things are starting to fall off the back of the truck, things are getting shaky, because we all have been there where things start getting chaotic and unmanageable, sit in your fucking house or wherever, get a piece of paper out and write down where you're at. I am homeless. I am fucking have cases pending. Write it down. Get honest with yourself. Seeing it in black and white is powerful. Then go, what am I doing? Write it down. That is contributing to this and start fucking subtracting stuff. Don't add more. Don't go try to find all these extra things. Just start taking away stuff. Success is absolutely subtractive. Start taking away stuff and you'll start clearing up your, your mental bandwidth and pick a goal and start moving towards it. Brother, listen, for coming all the way over and telling your story, thoroughly enjoyed that. You're an inspiration. Would you like to finish up on anything else? No, James, I, I really appreciate it, bro. You uh, are crushing it on this platform. That authenticity is just dripping off you, bro. So I appreciate it. Yeah, anytime, brother. But for people watching, how can they get in contact again? Social medias, YouTubes, because yep. everything's just about to pop off you. Yep. You're going to start doing the rounds in the podcast scene. You're going to blow up. Yep. I know it. That's why I've got you here, brother. I appreciate it's, it, uh, So how can people get in contact with you again? So Instagram, <clears throat> TCAV official. You can always DM me there. I'm Johnny on the fucking spot with that. I'm, I'm, I got sparks flying off my phone. I'm on that thing so much, but it's important to be in contact. And my website, taylorcavanaugh.com. You can get all my contact information there. Brother, for changing your life, it's been unbelievable. Proud of you, and I look forward to seeing what you do for the future. Man, I appreciate it, James. God bless you, bro.